Hey Justin, thanks for doing this. Um, let's let's start the discussion by getting from you a, basically a snapshot of where the local property market is, because we've come off essentially a number of years where the downturn has been in place, uh, but there's indications that it's coming back in a strong way. W where is it now? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Trung. So I think the Malaysian property market right now has actually bounced back uh, tremendously uh, and also uh, exiting from the pandemic for the past two to three years. Uh, based on the latest uh, property market report uh, launched by NAPIC, it shows that uh, transaction volume have increased tremendously. Uh, it recorded more than, uh, I think, 80% uh, thousand, uh, sorry, 80,000 more transaction volume compared to the previous year. Yeah, this so, is residential or, or residential, or? residential. So I think for commercial and also industrial, transaction volume have also increased tremendously. So typically, what are the drivers of property investment? Because we essentially, property markets tend to move in, in 10 year cycles, right? Mm, yes. Quite, quite long cycles of down, downtrend. And then two or three years, maybe even four years of very rapid appreciation. And then, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. And then again, a long... So can you explain the cycle? Okay, so generally, yes, uh, the property cycle is always a 10-year cycle. And uh, the previous peak cycle was back in uh, 2010 to 2012 or 2013. So the next cycle would have arrived by now. But uh, because of the COVID and uh, pandemic situation back in 2020, it actually, how to say, uh, uh, stimulate the, the, the cycle. So that's why uh, we are seeing that the, our real estate market should have recovered in uh, 2022 or 2023 and we will be hitting the peak right now. But because of the COVID, it dampens everything. So it slows the process of the 10-year cycle. So what we are seeing right now is that uh, things are coming back and uh, instead of peak, this year should be a uh, recovery year for the real estate market. The 10 year cycle is interesting. So, if we can just spend a bit of a couple of minutes on this, right? Why does it move in this like 10, 3, 10, 3, or even 10, 4, 10 years down, 4 years up, 10 years down? Why does it typically move in these ways? Oh, in, in fact, I think there's, how to say, there's not really a proper way to explain this uh, 10 year cycle. Uh, but basically, there are pe people saying that property markets have always been lagging behind. The, the share markets or, or any other sort of uh, markets. So, because property is illiquid. So that's why it's a very safe investment cycle. Sometimes uh, the property cycles can also drag more than a 10 year period. Yeah, mm. so because we're coming out of a, like this, this kind of like a once in a lifetime events like COVID and yeah. all, all these things. And essentially also the Fed rate policy, right? Um, could it be a case that when the upcycle in Malaysian property market comes, it's going to come at an even steeper rate or even a more high, high, higher peak than the last one? Well, what's your point of view? Okay, uh, to, to be honest with you, I think our Malaysian market is, uh, I, I'm talking about uh, real estate market. Mm. Our Malaysian real estate market is uh, very resilient and very much well insulated and protected as compared to some of the major markets in the region, like Singapore or Hong Kong. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, you won't see much volatility in our real estate market as compared to the other major markets. And, and having said that, that's the reason why our real estate market, uh, price movement, appreciation rates, uh, demand supply and all that, it's not as uh, uh, volatile or, or like what you said earlier, the, the, the strong uh, exponentially growth peak. The, the peaks and troughs are not as high. Yeah. I remember Hong Kong. Hong Kong has had property crashes. Yes. Fact, yeah. Singapore has had the property crashes. Malaysia, not really, right? Malaysia, not really. Yeah. <coughs> In so fact... Why, why is that? Uh, because we, we are very much well protected. We have very good uh, rules and regulations. Uh, whenever there's a, 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 a signal or probably a, a very strong cycle uh, to show that there is an oversupply, uh, or there's an over, overheating of the market. The Malaysian government is very quick at reacting at all this and they will come with uh, monetary and fiscal policies and cooling measures just to control to, and to prevent a uh, property bubble from happening. So the, I think the, the only shock 
that I know of was way back uh, during the Asian financial crisis in 1997. That, that was a very great shock to the real estate market, not, not only to the uh, share market, but real estate as well. And, and having said that, the GFC, the global financial crisis back in 2008, that actually did not uh, affect much on our real estate market. Mm. Yeah. It did come off, but not to the point where it just hit rock bottom and yes. were massively underwater and yes. liquidations. Lah. Correct. Okay, so, so militating against real estate investment are many things, right? The lack of liquidity, as you say, mm. long down cycles, uh, many layers of costs, you know, taxes yeah. and, and all, all these other things. But yet, it, it remains an investment mainstay, lah, right? Yes. Um, what are the drivers behind why people at a residential level like to buy investments? Maybe you can shed more light. And also for industrial guys, you know, why do they, as you say, now they look at Malaysia in a big way, what are the drivers there? Okay, uh, one of the reasons why real estate is a very well sought after investment asset class in Malaysia because it's uh, easy entry. First thing is because of easy entry. And we have a lot of uh, incentives for our first home buyers to promote uh, purchase of their first homes. That's the reason why there, uh, there are a lot of uh, interests in terms of uh, real estate investment. Uh, other than that, uh, there is not much of uh, alternative investments in, in Malaysia. Uh, you, you, the things that you can look at are basically unit trust. Uh, then of course you have uh, the share market. And then of course you have the alternatives like uh, REITs, real estate investment trust. Uh, other than that, real estate is a very, <clears throat> how to say, a, a secure and a safe haven for investors. Yeah, obviously you've got this whole idea that you can leverage, right? Because yeah, correct. One million property, you just have to put on 10%. Yes. It's still a lot of money, but it's not one million. You can put on a hundred thousand. And even I think way back when, the, some developers offered you much lower down payment. Oh yes, zero down. Zero yeah. down, right. Zero down, and we even had a DIBS. Uh, developers developer interest, bearing interest bearing scheme where you don't even have to pay interest during the construction period. Yeah. So, but then the things with real estate investment, a lot of it is driven by sentiment as well, right? Yeah. Uh, if you only if you're confident about the future, if you're confident about your income, then you start to buy. But you know, you're saying that the wave of interest is both at an individual retail residential level mm. as well as at an enterprise, you know, corporation level. What are the drivers there? Okay. In in fact, I think. Uh, We've been brought up, I think, uh, to preserve our wealth. The way to preserve our wealth is actually through real estate. Uh, especially that this holds true for a lot of our Chinese families. So I have my uh, friends, I have my own relatives, I have my, my granddads and all that. They have actually rubber plantation and all. So we preserve our wealth through real estate. And I believe this is very common, not even in Malaysia, but all over the world. So uh, if you look at all the uh, celebrities or you look at all the uh, high net worth individuals, uh, they put, uh, I think, quite a bulk of their money into real estate. Even though, like what we have mentioned earlier, it's uh, not really liquid, but at the end of the day, I think real estate is still a very attractive uh, investment asset class because like what you said, we can leverage on it and not forgetting uh, capital gain. So, people say that why we like to invest in real estate because they don't make lands anymore. So, it's a, a, a finite supply. So, scarcity of land. So, all these come into play. So, I still remember uh, I have my, uh, my dad's relative back in my hometown where they bought into oil palm plantation 20, 30 years ago at only 450 ringgit per acre, okay? And guess how much is it now? 20, 20 30 000. years later. 100,000 ringgit 100, per acre. Yeah, and, and we are talking about oil palm plantation. So now going back to something which is more uh, common to us, which is, let's say, residential real estate, by just putting down a 10% uh, money, your, your own equity, you are actually able to own a property on your own. So you can use that property for your own use or you can rent it out for investment return. Yeah, I mean, I'm from Penang, right? And uh, my father, who, who, who is, was a lawyer, 
used to um, do some work for the the late great uh, Lo Bunziu, ah, country Lo Bunziu. Yes. Honda, he's, he's the guy who brought the Honda to Malaysia. And he, every spare cent he made, he bought property. He just, his reasoning was that um, land is finite. And yeah. you can't, you know, it, it, land is only there, created once, and yeah. you can't photocopy land. Correct. So he's, he was a massive land buyer all over the Penang Island, all over the mainland. Mm. And till today, Oriental Holdings, I think, yeah. is the whole asset. They still own huge swaths of land, yes. which has not even been developed for 30 years, you know. Mm. And yeah, land bank value, I can't even imagine how much it's worth now. Mm. So, so you know, the old tycoons, you know, look that way. I think some certain principles hold true, right? But then equally, like when it comes to, say, other types of property investment, right? Mm. Some younger investors might look at, say, okay, oh, I, I don't have the liquidity with, with land and real estate. It takes too long to sell. Then they look at REITs. So, so what is the reasoning behind buying REITs instead? And REITs are, of course, real estate investment trusts. Yeah, so REITs are actually a, a form of uh, asset class which is asset-backed. Uh, REITs actually own real estate and the income stream is actually coming from the rental generated from the uh, assets owned by REITs. So I think uh, REITs is a very good uh, asset class to invest in because basically you are still owning part of the assets owned by the REITs as, uh, because you are the shareholder in the REITs that owns the uh, asset classes. And, and one thing good about REITs is that uh, they are professionally managed and professionally run. And on top of that, you'll be able to partake and participate in the uh, business per se. Yeah, yeah. so, so there's, there's tons of REITs. In America, it's a very advanced REIT market. You can have REITs specific mall REITs, yeah. uh, airport REITs, you can have warehouse REITs, you can have all hotel REITs, and it's very specific. In Malaysia, I think we were just at the start of the whole REIT cycle. Okay. Singapore also is quite developed, but let me talk about Malaysia. What kind of REITs are there? I think uh, Malaysia, we have about 15 REITs. Uh, like what you said, uh, we have uh, different REITs that are focused in uh, different kind of asset classes. Like for example, uh, YTL Hospitality REIT. So this is a REIT that focuses purely on uh, uh, hotels. And of course, we have uh, uh, shopping mall REITs that focuses uh, purely on shopping malls, like for example, uh, Pavilion REIT. And uh, we do have some other REITs that are very much well diversified, like uh, Sunway REIT. They have uh, hotels, they have industry, warehouses, they have malls, and they have office buildings in, in the REIT. So, and we have also uh, some healthcare REITs where they own hospital buildings rented out to uh, healthcare operators. Yeah, so when it comes to selecting which REIT to go for, um, what we have learned from COVID is that certain REITs are particularly vulnerable to, um, you know, once in a lifetime um, crises. Yep. So, of course, if you rent a hotel or a mall during COVID, you would have had zero income at that time and mm. they got whacked, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you were if you were an owner of a REIT which was involved in, in e-commerce warehousing, you would have had a very nice run-up in, yeah. in income and share price because of the whole you know, e-commerce boom during lockdown. So how would you advise, you know, when it comes to selecting in, in REITs, right, how would you advise the considerations involved? Okay, I think generally REITs are very safe stocks. So... Regardless of the recent happenings, for example, like what you said, the once in a lifetime kind of uh, situation, like for example, COVID. Uh, having said that, I think uh, REITs are very safe stocks. Uh, it's just a, a blip, you know, just a certain blip within the a certain period of time. And I, I think uh, ignoring that, if you look at the long term of a REITs uh, portfolio, uh, generally, they are giving quite a very good uh, dividend returns because all these are actually uh, uh, income generating from the rental yields of the assets. And uh, once the pandemic is over, you can see that consumer spending have been increasing a lot and the occupancy of malls have actually uh, never much, how to say, uh, came down. In fact, I know. yeah. It's crazy. Now you try and go to Mid Valley, it's berserk. Yeah, and, and <laughs> once, and correct. Is, and, and the car park income alone contributes so much to the REIT's income. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, if you're a real estate investor, right, and you've had the difficulty of managing a, a bad tenant, yes. who, who doesn't pay on time, who misses... I mean, of course, you can get good tenants lah, if you're lucky, right? But 
if you've ever gone through the process of managing tenants, managing the costs of owning a real estate uh, a piece of real estate from the taxes to the bank loans yeah. the difference in interest rates and, and there's there's also of course the maintenance which is on, on your shoulders as a landlord yeah. um, there's a lot to to say in favor of owning a REIT because you've got the liquidity of a REIT you can just sell it yep, on correct. the open market yes. in three days you get your cash if you try and sell a property now, it took me over a year to sell my leasehold mm. property. Mm. It was a nightmare. Right? Yeah, because you have to get state consent state if it's consent, a leasehold property. Fees, yeah, you know the timelines and the deadlines involved. It, it was quite messy, lah. Yeah. Would you advocate one or the other? Would you advocate both? Uh, I I would advocate both actually. Yeah. So for okay, for example, I had uh, a property, a mm. condo, which I bought when I first started work in, back in two thousand. Seven, so I, I bought it for two hundred eighty thousand, just about there, and I like what I, what we have mentioned earlier. Put the ten percent down uh, as a down payment, and then I borrow the rest. So what happens is that for the ten years that I own the condo, it was actually rented out. It was rented out at the amount which is higher than what I pay the bank oh, my so you, my repayment. You had, you had what is known as a positive cash yeah positive cash flow okay throughout the ten years. And 10 years later, I sold the condo at about 580,000. Really yeah. Mm. And my debt, my, my outstanding loan amount was only at about 160,000. So on top of that, I had positive cash flow. I don't need to pay for the maintenance because everything is being paid for by the rental. But those days are gone because now the entry price of even a nice condo is already like easily 400,000. Right? Yeah. Yeah. To get that kind of multiple, two, uh, two times your money, three times your money, mm. for a half a million condo in KL now to go to 1 million or 1.5 million, uh, say lah, huh? it's, wow, you can't even see it in the horizon already, right? I, I think, so how, how would you advise? I, I think it's, it's not, not a problem at all because prices will always increase. Uh, property prices will always appreciate. If you look at the long-term trend line of real estate pricing in Malaysia, on average, we are talking about Kager of 2 to 3%. Compared to annual growth. Right? Yeah. Okay. Or even at par, or if so for some of the properties that I've looked at, even higher than our inflation rate. So it's like 3 to 4%. Not so easy. Okay, mm. there's, there's many places in, I've had many horror stories of people telling me, I won't say which area. Like, <laughs> I bought this area, then underwater for 20 years. On. Mm. So what are the considerations for buying a physical property? Okay, so... Uh, property gurus always say, uh, location, location, location. So it's always about location. Okay. Yeah. Okay, get to the second level. What makes a good location? Okay, uh, you have to look at the availability of our infrastructure and accessibility. So for example, like uh, we are talking about MRT, uh, the Line 2 just being launched yesterday. So look at places with uh, infrastructure such as MRTs or... or or shopping malls, or, or highways, uh, uh, toll plazas, uh, ingress, egress, interchanges, and all that. Yeah, so you should focus along all these kind of uh, infrastructure facilities and amenities. Okay, so that on that consideration alone, in KL, there's maybe 15 different re precincts or areas mm, which mm, fit okay. that profile, right? How do you narrow it down from there? It also depends whether uh, your target market, who you want to rent it out to whether you want to rent it out to expat markets. So that you have to look at uh, Mon Chiara or KLCC area or maybe a KL South area like in Bukit Jale or even uh, Sungai Besi area. Mm. Okay, and then um, and then what about things like um, existing neighbourhoods versus you know new up-and-coming areas? So new up-and-coming areas could have been say, like say at Puchong for example, mm. right? Or Bukit Jale for example. Between that and say an existing neighborhood like say Tamanta or Ampang or, or Damsha Heights or you know Bukitungku, of course not light for light lah, huh? mm. but the considerations like say Penang lah, just say mm. Penang Island, right? Do you buy Tanjung Munga or do you buy like um, you know near airport south southern side? One is up and coming, the other one is yeah. established. So one is low risk, one is like okay, don't know how. So at the end, but it also comes back to yield play as well. Uh, are you an investor looking to rent out and looking at yields? So traditionally, I think uh, if you're looking at you play, high-rise is the way to go because uh, high-rise gives you better return. But of course, 
the trade-off is basically you have a lower appreciation rate. And if you go for capital gain, then definitely it's uh, landed housing that you should look at. Because the uh, landed housing you play is, is not very high. But the upside is basically you, you, you gain back from the capital gain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so like to answer your question, Tanjung Bunga, a very matured area. You have a very good uh, population catchment. And comparing to, let's say, the, the second bridge, is it? Mm. That's an up and coming growth area. The south area? Yeah, south area. Yeah. So I think Tanjung Bunga, definitely you may want to go for a yield play. Okay, because I think there's a ready catchment condos of population condos. Yeah. So uh, it's readily, uh, readily ten tenanted to uh, tenants, and you'll be able to get uh, quite a decent yield. And for growth area, go for landed. Yeah, new growth area, always go for landed because you are expecting the prices to move. And of course on the mainland as well, uh, the yeah. whole area there with Ikea. And Correct, right? yes, yes. Okay, let's talk about this um, thing which I think some investors don't think about too much, which is, which is interest rates. Okay? Mm. Now, interest rates, of course, um, dictate your borrowing costs. Yep. Of course, your how whether you have a no negative carry or a positive mm. carry, right? So. The interest rate policy in the last one one year and a half has basically been on an uptrend yeah. and very aggressively. So, how does it play into the mind? How should it play into your into your thinking when it comes to investment? Okay, so for example, uh, if you are an investor going into real estate, uh, investing in real estate to have uh, rental uh, yields, uh, you have to make sure that you are able to cover your expenses, your maintenance, and of course your loan repayment. And your loan repayment, of course, consists of your principal repayment and the interest portion. So when, when I go into real estate investment, yes, interest rate is very important. But at the same time, for me personally, as long as the rental that I receive is able to cover the interest portion, I'm actually happy enough. Yeah, but yeah. not many investors get a positive carry. Yeah. Now, with condos... I think the rule of thumb is that the higher you go, the better the, the view mm. and the higher the rental. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's even a formula for every 10 floors, you get how many percent extra or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's like about 1-2% extra. Uh -huh. yeah, the, the pricing floors, mechanism right. by the developers, like, basically. Uh, yeah. You get a view yeah. out as well, right? Correct, correct. And the other thing is, is, all, is also, is it, is it um, furnished, not furnished? Yeah, you know? yeah. So the, the thing is, you have to furnish it, spend a bit mm. of money, get yes, a nice place correct. to stay then you get a, high, a higher rental. Yep, you, you, and you'll be able to attract uh, tenants as well. Yeah. yeah. So those are the principles at play. La. Yeah. But what so, about things? Uh, okay. yeah. So let's say, for example, uh, we are going to hit, uh, I think we our interest rate is still 3% right now, but I think there'll be two more rounds of uh, interest rate hike this year. And even if it goes up to 3.25, it doesn't matter because uh, our Condo yields are still hovering around 4 to 5 percent. The 4 percent are prime condos. That seems optimistic. Oh, no, no, no. That's, that's, that's high rise yields in KL right now. Yeah. So 4 percent is uh, prime condo yields. 4.5 is still okay, not bad. Uh, 5 percent are the ones uh, that are less desirable, but somehow st still a decent location. Yeah. So when you go, the, the higher yields that you get are basically uh, riskier your investment, high risk, high return. Huh? Mm. So you, you can you can buy a low cost apartment at fifty thousand, then you rent out at five hundred ringgit a month, and That's you can and you can get a ten percent yield, yeah. but you're not gonna you 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 won't be sure whether you'll be able to get the payment. So high risk, high return. Mm. You can get a high yield, but you're not sure whether you can get the return or not. Yeah. Okay, so for property investors, now there's a lot of new townships that are outside of the Klang Valley for obvious reasons, uh, mm -hmm. land is scarce. So the big developers is the IGMs and the Kamudas and all that. They go further out. So yep. maybe you have to drive another 40 minutes or mm. 50 minutes or one hour to come into town, right? Yeah. Um, what about those assets and, and what are the factors there? And there's also the other factor, the whole thematic of work from home now. Yeah. That's also more acceptable. So how is that shaping, you know, how investors think about this, you know, more far-flung areas. Yeah, so this, these are all new townships uh, being developed by our blue-chip uh, developers and uh, they actually put a lot of money into 
building the infrastructure for, for these new townships. And uh, pricing wise, it is not too expensive. Not too bad, yeah, right? not too bad. Uh, that's the reason why uh, they have very good sales for, for all these uh, new launches. And they have very nice designs, uh, very good uh, layouts as well. Uh, and, and because of the COVID also, I think uh, a lot of us, uh, those who've been living in uh, high-rise condos, uh, felt that uh, it's very cramped staying at home, be, being locked down and all that. So that's the reason why I think uh, people nowadays, they rather stay further away, but enjoy a better quality of life. Is urbanization still happening, Justin? You know, like last time, we mm. see people coming from small town, Taiping, you know, Pak yep. and all that. They come to KL to work. Mm. Is that still happening in Malaysia? I think the trend is still there, but generally, people are also taking the option to explore elsewhere, smaller, smaller towns. Mm. Yeah, because uh, we can work anywhere for now with the onset of the uh, pandemic. It shows that we can actually work remotely. Like, for, take for example, my company, uh, Nike Frank Malaysia, yeah. we are now on a permanent hybrid working. Oh, permanent yeah, hybrid? Permanent hybrid cool. working. Yeah, permanent hybrid working. So we can choose whether you want to work in the office, work from home, or work anywhere else. That's definitely something to stay ready, now, right? Yeah. I think probably going going back to the interest rate and, and not able uh -huh. to cover the interest and the maintenance cost and all that through the rental. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, that there are I, I've been hearing uh, browsing through Facebooks and talking to my friends. Uh, I've been hearing a lot of comments saying that they bought a the house, uh, then they borrow money from the bank for five hundred thousand, but after paying for ten years, their outstanding loan amount is only is still 400,000. Means they have been paying for 10 years and they have been paying for hundreds of thousands, mm. but their principal payment doesn't go down, doesn't go down that much. Okay. It, it only went down by 100,000. Uh, so, and, 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 and they just kept arguing, saying that they pay so much for interest, this and that. But have, do they understand that, uh, yes, interest payment is a lot, but have you found out what's your current house value today you would have bought at 550,000 10 years ago but now your property that you bought 10 years ago at 550k could be worth 1 million right and the interest payment that you have paid could be amounting to about 200,000 and on top of that you would have paid down 100,000 and you still owe the bank 400,000 and you gain so much on your equity so a lot of people, they did not see this. They, they don't see this. They're only talking about how much they have paid for their interest. The interest cost is very high. The other thing which also sometimes escapes notice is the fact that if you can get a very long loan, say 35 years or 32 years, then your cost of installment every month is lower. Lah. Yeah. So basically, it's a, it's a time game. Yes. So the younger you are when you buy a property, the better Correct. Be because you can get a longer loan. I yes. Banks only lend you up to 65 years old, right? Uh, 60 or 65? Yeah, 60 or 65. 60, yeah. So 65. So if you're 25, you can get a 40-year loan. Uh. Mm. So your monthly loan is quite low. So basically, if you're like 50 years old, right? <laughs> you're going to buy a property. You've only got a 10 to 15-year window to get a... So you're, you know, for example, for me, my loan will be very, very high, mm. right? So I think the message is that if you're going to buy a property, just get it when you're younger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't, don't like when you first, when you earn your first sum of money, yeah. I also know a lot of people who actually went and purchased cars. And that's me included, of course. <laughs> but and me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, advice, yeah, the advice is basically if, if you earn uh, first bucket of money, you just put it into real estate. Yeah. Because the real estate is a preservation of wealth. Yeah. And what is about that, the whole notion about uh, uh, real estate being a good hedge against inflation, right? So basically, yeah. you appreciate at a rate faster than Correct. inflation. Right? Yeah. How does that work? And because inflation in the last you know few months, a couple of years, has been very, very fast, higher, at a real rate, uh, not, not official rate, mm. at a higher real rate. Uh, yeah. Is that still true? Okay, yeah, I think it still holds true. Uh, like what you mentioned, I think for the past two years, or maybe don't say past two years, past one year, because of the because we we, we came out from the COVID, so everyone like tried to what they call it revenge spending. Is it that's the reason why I think the consumer spending increased a lot for the past one year, 
and our inflation rate actually hit for certain months hit four percent. I think more than four percent. At a real rate, it's much higher. At a real rate, it's much higher, definitely. But if you look at it on a long term basis as well, I think probably you are talking about two percent. Mm. Yeah, on average per annum. So coming back to the point that I raised earlier, uh, the CAGR of real estate capital appreciation is definitely higher than our average inflation rate. Over the long term. Over the long term. Yeah. So long yeah. term means 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Don't need to be so long. You, you talk about eight years is good enough really. Eight, ten years is good enough really. It's definitely higher than our inflation rate. And, and another thing is that real estate is actually uh, a long term investment play. You do not trade in real estate. I mean, you can if you get a good deal. Transaction cost and price. Yeah, like correct. Bottom, yes, yeah. yes. So, some, but of course, sometimes when, when you're, you're able to purchase a below market value asset, then you can actually flip it for profit. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you want to flip a real estate and to use it as a trading platform, uh, I think it's, 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 it's not, not yeah, not optimum for that. So it's always a long term. Flip the REITs because REITs, uh, REITs are fantastic because you, for, for basically, let's just say Sunway REIT, uh, I think essentially for one ringgit 60 per share, mm. you can buy into uh, into the malls and into the yeah. things that they got, which is pretty interesting, right? Yeah. Same goes for Pavilion, for whatever it's per share Pavilion is, you can get the Pavilion KL. Yes, <laughs> you can get the pavilion yes. Pavilion yep. Pavilion. Yep. So when it comes to REIT selection, right? Mm. Um, you've also got the whole idea f away from Malaysian REITs. You've also got, you've also got Singapore REITs. Yeah. You can buy American REITs. Yep. So how should people think about buying REITs? Should they buy Singapore REITs? Should they buy Malaysian REITs? How should they think about that? Okay, I think uh, for a start, if you are a first timer going into share markets, uh, share market investing, uh, the safest stock you can invest, invest in is actually uh, REITs. You can just buy into REITs and just leave it and close your eyes, it will just uh, run for you. Yeah, so it's uh, one of the safest stocks in the share market. And comparing MREITs to Singapore REITs, I think our MREITs is about 10 plus years or 20 years really, if not mistaken. And uh, Singapore REITs are very much a, a major REITs market. And they have a very good selection of uh, REITs as well. Uh, uh, but in terms of sectors that they are in, it's quite similar actually. Yeah, yeah the and yeah, the dividend payouts are also quite good. So it's the 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 yield rates are also quite similar. So the the the, the other thing that a lot of investors might not realize, but it's also true in the last you know his, in historical terms, is the fact that if you buy a Singapore asset. You got to, you're going to get, in addition to what you're going to get in terms of return on the dividend and capital appreciation, you're also going to get a, a, a foreign exchange. Oh, yes, yes, okay. yeah. So if you convert your ringgit to, say, Singapore dollar and buy a Singapore rate, let's just say, Kipo DC rate, mm. for argument's sake for now, right? Every year, you're going to get an additional 2 maybe 3% in, in forex appreciation from buying the Singapore yeah. dollar. Yeah. So should that be a consideration? Yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, I do have friends who invest in the uh, Singapore Stock Exchange. Mm and uh, they are also uh, able to make a lot of money this way. So that's like mm. a triple whammy upside. Mm. Triple yeah. appreciation, yep. you buy a good read, you get your dividend, dividend yield. Yep. The Singapore, do they pay two or, four, two or four times a year? I think they also pay four times a four year. Four times a mm. year, right. And then you also get the Forex, so that's interesting. Mm. Does that make it a stronger consideration than say a Malaysian read? Definitely. I mean, if you have the ability to invest in Singapore REITs, then that's a very good choice to look at. Which means to say you've got to have the, uh, the foreign account, the Singapore Yeah, you account. have to have a Singapore account. Okay, yeah. okay. And then of course the barrier is a bit higher, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure because I think from my, my friends told me that uh, the it's more difficult for us to open a account in Singapore, mm. a shares account. Mm. Yeah. But I think it's, it can still be done by using, I think, some online platforms. Yeah, online trading platforms, I think. Yeah, yeah. you'll be able to do it. Yeah. So then come talk about REITs, right? Uh, and one of the up-and-coming areas, um, 
as a, well, cap, cable DC read. Mm. Cable DC read is basically cable data centers. Yeah, and correct. That's another huge thing because it's the it's kind of like a proxy play on the whole internet phenomenon, the whole e-commerce phenomenon, the you know buy yeah. from home, shift from physical malls to online malls, mm. Shopee and Lazada and all these other things, right? It seems to me now that the data center reads are in a bit of a downtrend. Mm. Because of the Fed interest rate policy, mm. but that won't hold true for the long term. Because eventually the Fed will, will pause in the interest rate hikes, and then eventually it will start to cut rates. Mm. I think the conventional thinking is that by the year twenty twenty four into the second half of next year, they will start to cut rates. So what what is your feedback in that on that whole a- phenomenon? Yeah, so I think uh, it comes back to the fact that uh, I think REITs are also considered as a long-term play and a uh, this defensive stock. Yes, uh, there may be some up and downs in, in the share price of the REITs uh, based on what you said, like cuts in the uh, in, increase in, in the federal rates or, or happenings in elsewhere in the world, uh, geopolitical uncertainties, uh, wars, trade wars. Uh, tensions and all that but other than that I think uh, REITs for the long term it's uh, very stable okay and despite that if your share price is down you're you're actually getting a higher dividend yields yeah. basically yeah. yeah so that's the unspoken thing as well Correct. only people who know they know and mm. those who don't know they won't know yeah, yeah. The, and, and also I think to a certain extent the, the reason why some of the REITs are paying high dividend yields uh, it's also because the, the share price uh, there's, there's not much volume and, and the assets that they own is not a very uh, prime asset that's the reason why uh, they are able to pay higher dividend yields that's the reason why when you invest into REITs you have to actually uh, look at their portfolio. You have to analyze their portfolio, whether they consist of prime assets or they consist of the second and lower tier kind of uh, assets classes. But in for the long term, I think data center uh, will, def- will definitely be in a limelight. I think right now we have been receiving a lot of inquiries and a lot of investments into Malaysia in terms of uh, a data center. Uh, not only that, I think in, in the region as well. Mm. So I think um, focusing on data center REITs is also uh, a, a way to go in terms of uh, investment. Going back to what you said about um, blue chip REITs, second tier REITs, third tier REITs, because that's really driven by portfolio um, merit. Lah, huh? mm. um, you can't compare, say, for example, a Pavilion Mall with some, okay, I'm not going to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Tier yeah. Mall somewhere yeah. in. You know, let's just say in the Subang or what? Yeah. yeah. Um, what what kind of names would be a blue chip REIT basket, for example, and why? I, I think the the so called uh, blue chip REITs that I, I can think of are definitely uh, names like Sunway REITs, uh, Pavilion, IGB REIT, uh, and we have a new REIT which is called AME REIT that is purely focusing on industrial asset classes. So that last name is not a household name? What yeah, it's, it's still a considered a new REIT because it was uh, they just had their IPO last year. And the share price really jalan? Uh. Oh yeah, they yes. They yeah. student housing, right? Oh uh, no, they, they have a mixed bag of uh, industrial asset classes. In, uh, they do uh, uh, mostly industrial uh, cl- uh, classes, uh, includes uh, workers, accommodation. workers accommodation. Yeah, accommodation, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, so, so when you buy a blue chip REIT, Let's just say IGB, for example, you mm. get dips into Mid Valley and yeah. the other stuff as well, yeah. right? Um, but their yields are not so high, five percent or something. Oh like yes, that. yes. So, um, so so why? So so it's the whole risk reward equation, right? Yeah. The higher the risk you take, the higher your return. Yeah. The lower the risk you take, the lower your return, right? Yeah. So, like what I said, these are blue chip REITs, uh, and blue blue chip REITs, and the assets that they own are actually very prime asset classes. So. Prime assets based technically have lower yields because it's less risky and it's considered as a safer asset class. So that's the reason why uh, their actual asset yields are lower at about 6% or 6 plus percent. And the long term, do these share prices go up? I mean, how, oh, does yeah. that, okay, how does that work? Yeah, definitely. I think for Sunway Reed, I remember their IPO price was at about 
88 cents. Sunday yeah, Sunday wheat, if not mistaken, back in 2011. Yeah, so along the way, as they grow their portfolio, the, uh, and, and as they grow their rental income stream, their share price have actually increased to 160. Yeah, it's the same for Pavilion. Pavilion, I think, um, the IPO price was about 90 cents or one ringgit, if not mistaken, and uh, it was able to grow to one ringgit plus as well. Uh. Okay, so basically, share prices rise because earnings rise, and earnings rise because of couple, at least a couple of things. Rental one, revisions. One, of course, every three years they get to increase yeah. rentals. The other thing is they will reinvest or they'll borrow more money to their threshold to go and buy more assets. Yep. And when you buy more assets, you get more in more more rental income and of yep. course your your multiples will match your increase in income, yeah. right? So if you say um was it Sunway Reed mm. has basically had an eighty percent increase in ten years, mm. that's about an eight percent return a year. Yeah. Okay. And then and that's before your dividend payout. That's before your dividend yeah. payout. So if you say inflation is say four percent, you're twice the rate of inflation, which mm. is why they say uh, property is, you know, as yeah. inflation hedge against Yeah, hedge against inflation, mm. correct. Mm. Um I noticed that Sunway recently bought um, the assets, the the hypermarket assets. Oh yes, India, yes. Right, paid I don't one and a half two billion for that, mm. right? Uh, so why do two, they do that? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So they're gonna manage hypermarkets and will they redevelop it? I mean, what's the thinking there? No, I think uh, to some extent, uh, it's more of a corporate play uh, for EPF as well as uh, Sunway Reed, because uh, Sunway Reed has to grow their assets in, in to, to actually to to able to pay back and give uh, better dividend yields to the shareholders to the unit holders so i think the six hypermarkets owned by epf is a very uh, good uh, investment by sunway because uh, these are basically hypermarkets location in 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 very good locations but some people might say hypermarkets are dying, right? That's why mm. Tesco got out and, you know, some people might say it's, you know, it's kind of like a dying breed you can buy online, you know. And, you yeah. You get your butler to go to Giant Grocer and order, order your stuff. Yeah. You. Having said that, I think Sunway being a expert in terms of uh, development and in, in terms of uh, retail, uh, they'll be able to find ways to probably turn around these uh, six hypermarkets. Yeah. Is there, is that re redevelopment? Oh yes, that's definitely. I think a so few the of the sites. Have been tweaked to allow them to become yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Right? Correct. Uh, so so SC guidelines. Awesome. Yeah, the the new SC guidelines. I think uh, they are catering for REITs to actually uh, go into development. Yeah, I think up to fifteen percent of their market size. Okay. Mm. Market size meaning what? The market value. The market. The the market cap probably. Yeah. Or or, or the asset asset value. Yeah. Oh, the asset value. Mm. Oh, okay, so so then they become they can become developers as well, mm. build themselves and then sell themselves and manage some of those properties. Themselves. Yeah, yeah. So, in your opinion, what kind of like um, a catalyst is that for uh, REITs? Uh, okay, because so is far it, is it a, is it a, is it a material catalyst or is it something which is okay? It's not bad, but it's not huge. Mm, okay. All this while, uh, our REITs players are always, uh, how to say, it's being sponsored by their sponsors, which is, for example, Sunway REIT is sponsored by Sunway Group. Pavilion REIT is sponsored by Pavilion Group. They are all developers themselves. And if a REIT is able to undertake their own design and development, definitely there is opportunities for them to actually make more money for the shareholders. But won't that cannibalize the, the sponsor's underlying business? Uh, it depends actually. Depends on the corporate strategy as well. Hmm. Yeah. So they yeah. could even do something which is in tandem or... Correct, correct. Really non-competitive. Non yeah, okay. yeah. So moving forward, uh, what are the trends shaping real estate you know, in Malaysia now? What, what are the new areas? You know, I mean, we, we've come a long way from the last 50 years, mm. you know. Um, obviously, there's still a shortfall in housing, I would say, especially affordable housing. But beyond that, what are the trends? What are the themes? I think uh, coming out from pandemic, the industrial sector have shown tremendous growth. And even though there is a tapering of demand right now, but definitely industrial sector will be here for the long term because uh, we are still a very much a manufacturing sector, uh, a manufacturing uh, country. So the industrial, in terms of whether you're talking about 
logistics and warehousing, uh, E&E, &E, electrical and ele electronics. We are, it's all here for, to stay. Sites and like yeah, sites, correct, uh -huh. yes. And places like the Greece in Milan, in Nilai, and Sundayan, in Penang, people are fighting for lands, for industrial lands in Penang. People are paying top dollars in Shah Alam. People? What do you mean people? As in like uh, the owner occupiers. Owner occupiers as well as tenants, logistics players, E and E operators, manufacturers. But then once you have a manufacturing site, other things will sprout out around it, like mm. highways, roads, transport hubs, buses, planes. Not only that, I, I think it's the other way around. Yeah. So probably this uh, they'll so called follow, they'll follow the they will follow the infrastructure. So for example, you have a highway, uh, let's say from uh, Labu to KL, uh, Nigris Milan. That's where you see uh, Sundayan actually came up. Then you, you look at uh, Bandar N stack, you have a KLIA highway. That's, the, that's why you see there's also a high-tech, uh, so-called industrial uh, hub in uh, N stack as well. And the reason for that is because if you have a infrastructure, transport infrastructure near around you, you can bring materials to your site. Mm, you can send yeah. finished products out. Correct. Right? So that's the reason why if you look at our peninsula map, right, you can see that a lot of the developments of industrial and logistics hubs are all along our major highways. Yeah. So follow the highways, follow the ports, follow yeah. the hubs. So where are the new hubs, where are the new highways? Of course, uh, now we are talking about uh, West Coast Expressway. Okay. Uh, that's why you see uh, there are a lot of uh, developments coming up in uh, West Coast uh, along the new highway. Uh, Ijo side, Banting side, all the way along Selangor and Perak coast. Prescribable values around those areas? Or? Has been increasing. Wow. Yeah. So, Banting? Oh, Banting have been increasing tremendously. Uh, yeah. What is it now? Easily 60, 75 ringgit per square foot. Uh, for land? Or for land, for, for land, land only. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's not cheap. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. And then what about northern side? What about southern side? What's happening there? What, um, I'm talking about the small plots, uh. yeah, yeah, small small, plots. small industrial plots. I'm not talking about the, the large uh, industrial okay. hubs. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. So if you're talking about a few hundred acres or thousand acres industrial hubs, then probably it's lower. lower, lower yeah. Course, yeah. Yeah. So, so industrial is one theme which is mm. going to stay for the next, I don't know how long, right? Yeah. What else is moving? I think uh, data center. Data center is the, the next big thing. Uh, in fact, Data centers have been around for quite some time uh, in Cyberjaya and all this while we have been focusing on colo data centers, co-location data centers and right now we are slowly moving towards our hyperscale data centers. Yeah. Hyperscale? hyperscale data centers are basically uh, data centers that are being occupied solely by the uh, service providers such as uh, Facebook, Microsoft, AWS like what uh, uh, Amazon Web Services that have just announced that they are coming into Malaysia for the next seven years we'll be spending about 25 billion ringgit investment into Malaysia. Yeah, yeah so these are all the hyperscalers. Microsoft, Microsoft is already in, in Johor. Yeah. Yeah. So the area for data centers concentrated in southern side, Johor side? Right now it's southern side, Johor side, yeah. Mm. And where's the next movement? Uh, Probably, I think uh, the, the main three locations are always Johor, Selangor, and Penang. Mm. Yeah. So Penang is more manufacturing, uh -huh. Penang is more manufacturing, but okay. uh, Penang, there is a uh, limited supply of uh, lands now. Mm. Yeah. So that's why you can see overspill into Kulim, into Kedah. Just on the subject of data centers, right? Because they are so energy um, sapping, lah. Mm. It takes a huge amount of energy to drive one data center, yep, right? Yeah. Um, does that come into play? Um, can Malaysia's power generation match it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, overall Malaysia have access of power. It's just that how to bring that power to these data center locations. That's that's the issue. And other than that, I think one of the uh, main requirements for data centers is basically we must have uh, two different independent power supplier, but as you know in Malaysia we only have a single operator which is TNB. So that's why uh, we may not be the hottest market for data center, but nevertheless uh, we ca we do still attract a lot of uh, international data center players to to come because 
in general, I think Malaysia is a very well placed uh, country in terms of infrastructure, uh, power, and talent as well. Yeah. Okay, so in summation, I guess uh, before I let you go, you know, it, it sounds like the, the real estate market in Malaysia is finally waking up. Yep. Okay, I think we're in for the next two or three years, which is going to be quite interesting. Mm. Maybe it won't spike as high because we're quite an insulated market. Um, how, you know, if you're looking at, you know, investment of some kind in here, what should be the main big picture factors at play? Okay, uh, I think trailing off from the peak in 2010 to 2013, uh, our real estate market have been very much subdued during the period go, uh, uh, right before COVID. So with COVID happening in 2020, it, it was like a double whammy for our real estate market. Yeah. We were bad enough really, and with COVID, and it's even worse. And because of that, it also... Uh, halted our real estate market recovery in 2022. So right now, 2023, uh, from what I've seen from all the data that I've seen is that, yes, we are slowly going back into recovery. Uh, transaction volume have been increasing. Average pricing, average values have also been stable. Uh, not only stable, uh, certain areas, certain locations have actually uh, appreciated even during the pandemic period. So I think as a whole, real estate market is still a very good uh, investment asset class. And to supplement your investment into real estate is basically REITs. Lah. Because you don't need to manage your tenants. You, you don't need to have like headaches uh, for your vacancy period. Uh, you don't need to go and manage and fix your, your, your unit. Maintenance is a yeah, thing. correct. Yeah. So with REITs, you have a professionally run outfit to do everything for you, basically. You are just a shareholder there, just waiting for dividends uh, every quarter. <laughs> Nothing will be nicer than seeing yeah. dividend land in your account. Every correct, quarter. correct. Yes, yeah. yes. That's fantastic, man. Hey, thanks a lot, Justin. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.